I've seen a lot of motherboards come across my test bench over the past few years, and ASRock typically holds the top spot when it comes to being the value king when compared to the likes of ASUS and MSI. However, their UFE, their overclocking, and their overall performance have typically left me looking for more when it comes to their higher end motherboards. Can this well spec board from ASRock merge the company's value based approach while introducing some of those top tier features that the mid range enthusiast deserves? Let's find out. Hey guys, Turk here. I hope you're having a great day. Behind me, you will find my wall of motherboards. I have tested the whole spectrum of motherboards, all the way from the premium chipsets, all the way down to the value-oriented stopgap maneuvers from all of the different manufacturers on the market. I have been known to give ASRock several thumbs up when it comes to their value-based boards, but I do tend to look elsewhere when it comes to the high and mid-range offerings. In the past, I've found that ASRock's boards, you know, they do provide value by adding in a whole bunch of extra whistles, but they do tend to get overshadowed by some of the other motherboard manufacturers' extra, you know, stability, performance, as well as their overclocking capabilities. The PG Velocita that I have behind me is their attempt at trying to, once again, merge those two mindsets while providing the extra bells and whistles that we like to see from their Tai Chi line, while still introducing those higher end features that some of their lower end motherboards don't have. And fortunately for us, this board happens to be a pretty good mixture of the two, and I'm going to be echoing a lot of the things I've said from my ASUS Z490 video. But we get ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about the board. We find some SATA cables inside the box, those nefarious NVMe screws, and a wireless dongle USB bracket. Now, here's something different. ASRock is going to be including their patent-pending graphic card holder. Simply install your motherboard into the case, place the card holder in the bottom right location, and just screw the entire unit into the case. Then, insert the standoff, rubber side up of course, and once the GPU is installed, slide that standoff up to support the GPU and tighten down the screw. This seems neat in theory, but in practice there's a couple different shortcomings that I don't think will work. First, if your graphics card has a really weirdly shaped heatsink, you know, that little stopper thing, it's just not going to fit really well. Also, if you're going to be routing your cables through your case and through the rubber grommets, then through the little card holder and into your SATA ports, you could come into some problems. Fortunately, though, this is an optional feature, so, you know, try it out, see if it works for you, and if not, just throw it back in your motherboard box. Taking a look at the back panel real quick, the Velocita supports all of the Socket 1200 processors, and it does have connections for HDMI 2.0 and DisplayPort 1.4 if your processor has an integrated GPU. We see 10 USB ports in total, including two USB 3 Gen 2s, six USB 3 Gen 1s, and two USB 2s. Realtek's ALC 1220 codec drives the 7.1 channel audio. ASRock also bundles in the Nahemic audio ecosystem for an enhanced audio experience over their lower tiered motherboards. Now, if you are worried about having network connectivity in this motherboard, man, ASRock has got you covered. The standard Intel i219V controller provides standard one gigabit networking, and they are also bundling in the killer E3100G controller for 2.5 gigabit connections, along with Killer's network optimization software. For Wi-Fi, Killer's AX1675X enables Wi-Fi 6E along with Bluetooth 5.2 for enabling the latest wireless technology onto the desktop. Now, I do wish that ASRock would have provided a different antenna solution because with just those little standard ears, you know, it's right next to your case, it's not going to provide the best connection, but, you know, again, it, it is what it is. All right, now guys, that was the easy part. Let's start to dive in and talk about the PCIe. The Z590 chipset supports both the Intel 10th Gen and their 11th Gen processors, supporting PCI Gen 3 and Gen 4, respectively. However, there are several caveats to keep in mind with this particular motherboard, so let's start us off with looking at the base PCI slots first. By default, the top two slots on the board support each processor's rated PCI spec at varying widths. If you've got one card installed into the top slot, it will get the full 16 lanes. With two cards installed, the top two slots operate with eight lanes. And if you have three cards installed, you get by eight, by eight, and by four. That bottom slot only supports PCI Gen 3. However, if you decide to enable CPU direct source LAN, things do get a little bit complicated. Effectively, that second slot is going to be populated and it forces that first slot to go into by 8 mode all the time. And if you're going to install a second card into that second slot, that one's only going to be having four PCI lanes added to it. 
Now let's talk about storage. NVMe is the latest craze and thanks to the 11th gen parts, Gen 4 NVMe is enabled through the top M.2 sockets on the board. However, this is not wired up for the 10th gen parts. The bottom two M.2 ports run SATA or NVMe Gen 3 cards, though some SATA ports get disabled when those are populated. However, when you have no NVMe installed, all six of the SATA ports are available for your use. So yeah, guys, that is a lot of asterisks to keep in mind if you're going to be picking up this board. So I highly recommend checking out the manual and contrasting that with what parts you're planning on putting into this particular system. Moving along, if you didn't think the back of the board had enough USB ports for you, the motherboard itself, it has a lot of extra jacks. The ASRock Z590 PG Velocita packs an additional USB 2 header for two more of those connections, two more USB 3 headers for four additional ports, and one blazing fast USB 3 2x2 front panel header can support up to 20 gigabit per second connections. One of the criticisms I've had with some of the other ASUS boards in the mid-range, mid-tier bracket is that they just don't have a lot of uh, fan headers at our disposal. The Velocita supports up to seven four-pin fan headers with broad support for higher wattage fans and all but the primary CPU and VRM fan header. More on those VRMs in just a bit. For RGB, the board comes equipped with pre-lit PCH as well as the back I.O. cover and it's not overly intrusive. If you're needing additional lighting, two 12-volt and two addressable 5-volt headers are available. Now, let's talk about overclocking support. The Z590 PG Velocita supports six doubled phases for the V-Core plus two additional phases going into the processor for a total of 14 phases. This could be considered a compromise compared to the Z490 design, trading 10 dedicated phases for six doubled phases. Either way, this board's Dr. Moss MOSFETs, they do pump out 50 amps apiece. Cooling the VRM are two heatsinks that look more like heatsinks than some of the other budget-based ASRock boards. Though the heatsinks are lighter than some of the other competitors in this tier, the PG Velocita has active air cooling across eight phases with the option of installing a second VRM fan across the top stack. And given the form factor of these fans as well as just where they're situated on the board, I find them far more effective as well as more aesthetically pleasing than the other ASUS boards I've reviewed in the past. The last creature comfort for benchtop tweakers is the inclusion of power and reset buttons along with the Dr. Debug display. Overall, this is quite a competent lineup of both features and hardware baked into the ASRock Z590 PG Velocita. Now compared to the rest of the ASRock product stack, I'm pleased to say that they have managed to migrate some of the design features from their Tai Chi product lineup as well as making incremental improvements to their previous Z490 PG Velocita. And at this price range, I think that is a solid win for this motherboard. But will all of these features really help out when it comes to our benchmarking suite? Today, I'm throwing in my 11900K from my launch review at the system and running through my automated test suite. I'll be equipping 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 at CL16, my RTX 3080, and a Gen 3 NVMe drive for my base OS drive. For more information on that test setup, look down in the description below. I'll be using the ASUS Maximus 13 Hero to compare a top shelf board against the ASRock offering for comparison today. Also, I'll be able to compare both the Intel prescribed power limits versus the no limits enabled against the PG Velocita's out of the box configuration. Now, before I get to the data, I want to talk briefly about the ASRock UEFI. Now, enthusiasts really prefer and love to see a well laid out and functional UEFI, and ASRock continues to provide their more traditional approach when it comes to their UEFI design. I am more familiar with AMD's options within the BIOS, so some of these newer Intel nomenclature, it is kind of foreign to me. Fortunately though, ASRock has done a great job of improving their descriptions for most of the fields, and most of it is listed in their documentation. I did find it pretty straightforward to navigate through the menus and adjust the settings, while also not seeing any conflicting menu choices that might confuse me. <laughs> Overall, a serviceable UEFI, but not as modern as some of the other approaches. Outside of XMP, I'll be running the Velocita with all options set to their default setting. Now, I'm going to be blazing through a lot of these charts today because not really much to talk about, so feel free to pause the video and look at some of the numbers if you're looking for anything specific. Now, let's set the foundation with looking at some synthetics, and let's start off with PCMark. Overall, the PG Velocita struggles slightly compared to the ASUS board with the Essentials and Productivity Suite. Digital content creation, however, sees a level playing field for both motherboards and power limits in use today. 
Looking at the other end of the synthetics, 3D Mark prefers unconstrained power limits, though the overall scores, just, they're really very close for each of the configurations. Moving on to real workloads, we again see the unconstrained processors performing better than the recommended Intel guidance, and we actually see the PG Velocita squeaking by in just a couple of instances. Each board trades blows in this comparison, and I'm pleased to see that even the limited power condition doesn't fare that much worse in many instances. One thing to keep in mind here, guys, is we are still early on in the 11th gen series life cycle. Uh, I went onto the websites and I noticed both ASUS and ASRock have put some new BIOS firmware out there, and that kind of threw a wrench into all of my data collection here. Uh, there are a couple different release notes. They are improving some of the CPU performance, and they're also including the new adaptive boost technology into the mix. So these charts that you're seeing today really are representative of what these boards are capable to, to do today. Moving to gaming, we do start to see some of the differentiation between the ASRock Velocita and the ASUS board. Ashes of the Singularity loves the additional power from the No Limits configuration and even gives the nod to the Velocita with a few extra frame advantage at 1080p and 1440p. GTA 5 shows similar results with average frame rates, but we're starting to talk about very narrow margins. Again, there are no surprises with Red Dead Redemption 2, but we see that the CPU's additional performance does buy us a couple extra frames at each of the resolutions. This same performance is also echoed with Shadow of the Tomb Raider and F1 2020. Assassin's Creed, however, shows very little difference in average frame rates regardless of the power setting for each of the motherboards today. Harkening back to my observation from the 10700K review, where the additional juice doesn't always translate to better gaming performance. The only interesting win for the PG Velocita today comes from Gears 5 at 4K, which arguably is purely GPU limited at this point. Given that 1080p and 1440p behave as expected, I'm willing to chalk this up as an outlier in an overwhelmingly uneventful performance comparison. With pretty much identical performance, what is there really to actually differentiate these two boards? Now let's pivot really quickly and look at something a little bit more interesting, and that's power consumption. I'm going to be measuring total system power draw through my kilowatt device, and I'm going to be putting it under three different system load conditions. That's going to be idle, kind of a light CPU workload, and then of course throwing Prime 95 to show the worst case power draw from our processor. Interesting here is that the Velocita manages to sneak by with less power draw in the lighter workloads, and it does shave off a couple of watts at peak CPU load. And when we pivot to temperatures, things seem pretty normal with the Intel power limits showing considerably less temperature generation. As for the PG Velocita, I see near equivalent temps for the CPU sensor and the VRM temperatures as reported by Hardware Info. This shows that the integrated fans on the VRM is critical for standard operation. So let's see how overclocking changes the stakes. As it turns out, hitting 5.2 GHz on my 11900K is really straightforward with the PG Velocita. Though not recommended, hitting this speed with Cinebench R20 only takes bumping up the multiplier to 52 and let her rip. Turns out the voltage setting in this condition was right at the high end of quote safe voltages at 1.45 volts on the V core. And fortunately for us, our Cinebench R20 score was an impressive 6382 on repeated runs. Our VRM temps seem to be creeping up from 50C to about 65C and the MOSFET fan ramps up to about 3500 RPM to try and compensate. This could be an issue for extended overclocks or if you're using even more excessive voltage, which might actually go in favor of some of the other higher end boards with the larger, bulkier, passive heat sinks. However, I did run a one hour long loop of uh, running Hitman 3, it's a pretty good CPU benchmark, and it actually didn't get my VRM temps above 73C. As always, this result is just a snapshot of what this board is capable of doing, and it's all going to depend on what type of cooler and what type of airflow you've got on your particular system. <laughs> now, I'll admit, I didn't do a full overclocking analysis with the memory with my 11th generation parts, but if you watched our video from last week, we, we used this motherboard with the 10700K, the 10th generation parts, and we were able to get our DDR4-3466 kit all the way up to DDR4-4000, which is really impressive for a dual rank uh, quad dim setup. Now, I'm still learning the ins and outs of the 11th generation hardware, but I'm pleased to say our best overclock came from our Hynix CDI kit by bumping up to DDR4-4000 from 3600 
or an 11% improvement. However, my Samsung BDI kit, it didn't perform as well. So, final thoughts on the ASRock Z590 PG Velocita. I think ASRock did a really great job of integrating some forward-looking features while still introducing some features that a lot of enthusiasts as well as gamers like to have, especially when trying to keep their systems around for as long as possible. With that said, this board does have its limits, and for extreme overclocking, you might be left wishing for a more established board. However, this begs the question, is the PG Velocita worth it? In this particular price bracket, you know, I do think ASRock is able to compete with the ROG Strix, the Aorus Ultras, and the uh, Gaming Pro Carbons from all the other vendors, but one could also say that those boards typically can be pushed even further than the ASRock is able to do today. On the flip side, there are boards out there that perform just as well as the Velocita that shave off the 6E Wi-Fi Nehemic audio and other features that ultimately inflate the cost. I think the ASUS Tough is a prime example of a competitor here. At the end of the day, I think the PG Velocita does a great job of performing, but it unfortunately sits in this weird spot in the middle ground between two different product categories. Only time will tell if this strategy will pay off for ASRock, but until then, keep those asterisks in mind. And guys, that's the review. I hope you've enjoyed it. You know, I've been testing some of these Intel 11th gen parts. There's a whole bunch of other topics I can cover. We can go into overclocking. We can talk about memory overclocking. PCI Gen 4 is a huge thing in my opinion, so I want to look into that in more detail. Let me know down below in the comments what you guys want to see from me going forward. Now, if you guys have any questions when it comes to picking parts for your PC, especially in times like these, make sure you go and join our Discord. We've got a, a deal alerts role you can sign up for where I like to tag and let you guys know parts are available. So make sure you do that. Follow me on Twitter. I like to talk trash over there a lot. So thank you guys for watching the video. I hope you all have a great one. We'll catch you in the next one.